welcome to our presentation today. Thank you everyone that is here. Um, my uh, dream job would be an elementary administrator, so I have geared this presentation for um, new teachers, specifically or new teachers to the building or, to, um, or new to education. Um, something that might be given at the beginning of a school year, um, that type of professional development. So it is geared for elementary educators. Hi everybody, welcome to our presentation today. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about special education and 504. We'll talk about some of the differences between the two and how we provide this for our learners in our school. For our first activity, I would like for you to do a turn and talk with the people sitting at your table groups. And what I want you to do is I want you to think of what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the words special education. Go. Awesome, meet me back in three, two, one, thank you. I heard some words like accommodations. I heard words like gifted. I heard words like data. Um, and all of these words definitely go hand in hand with special education and those learners that um, have those needs. What is special education and who do we serve? So any learner that has a diagnosed disability we can provide accommodations and services to meet those needs, either through an IEP or through a 504. And we will get more into that in a minute. So for special education, there are some common disabilities that are identified. Um, and some of the most common disabilities that we might see in our classrooms today would be things like learning disabilities, a speech or language, um, impairment, things like other health impaired or, um, or some type of developmental delay or an intellectual disability. So how does special education differ from a 504? Let's talk about that. So some of the basic differences between an IEP and a 504 an IEP plan is a specific individualized plan and structure of learning that is catered to that specific child and the needs that they have. Um, whereas a 504 is geared more toward the learning environment and what type of modifications can we make to the learning environment so that, that child can be successful. Both of these programs, both children under IEP or children under a 504 will both benefit from these and it is at no cost to the families. So this is a free service that is provided to those kids. And what law is applied? Um, learners that qualify and are eligible for an IEP, they are protected under IDEA. So that's the Individuals with Disability Education Act, and it's a federal, federal law that protects children's, children with special needs. And the, Section 504, they are protected under the Rehabilitation Act. To qualify and be eligible um, potentially for an IEP or an individualized plan uh, for that child, you must qualify and have a specific diagnosis of one of these 13 um, eligibilities, these 13 exceptions, which would include autism, deaf blindness, deafness, um, emotionally disturbance, intellectual disability, hearing impairment, multiple disabilities, um, orthopedic impairment, other health impaired, specific learning, speech or language, traumatic brain injury, and any type of vision impairment. What is the process to qualify learners for special education? So most of the time there's probably some progress monitoring and data collection that's happening within the classrooms. And you might recognize learners that are struggling. They're not um, making progress through RTI or intervention practices that you're doing and you're just not seeing that significant growth. 
So sometimes there might be a referral or suggestion for testing that might come from the educator. It can come from the parent. The parent can request an evaluation uh, for special education. It could be something that's discussed in a data meeting where um, a team of people might suggest or think this might be the next step. So then there's an evaluation process that will occur and happen uh, with parent permission. And then after that evaluation process, there is a meeting that will happen with administrators, the parent, the special education teacher, the diagnostician who gave the evaluation, um, and that determines eligibility and whether they might qualify for an IEP or whether they might qualify for a 504 plan. What does our program provide for learners? So this program will either provide an individualized education plan for that learner depending on their needs and their academic um, abilities at that time, or it will provide a 504 plan which will provide accommodations for that child in their learning environment um, that we can use to help provide um, so that they can grow and be successful. If they have an IEP, then inside that IEP will contain measurable short-term goals um, that are attainable by the child. And it will have a yearly updated meeting um, that will involve the whole team, including the parents. And sometimes when they meet yearly, sometimes goals are updated or changed if learners have met those goals. And accommodations are provided for both, whether they have an IEP or a 504. There are accommodations that are provided for them in the regular classroom and the special education classrooms as well. And then other tools such as manipulatives or physical things that they could have to help them succeed. Who is on the team that helps support the child? Um, there's always going to be a parent that will be on this team, um, parent or guardian, a district uh, representative or an administrator one regular education teacher, the special education teacher, and then maybe any specialists, which could include the diagnostician. Um, from time to time, the parents are also um, aware that they can invite and include any other specialists that maybe also see the child, like outside therapy um, or outside counseling that maybe they seek, or even some other experts they want to include in those IEP meetings. Um, they are welcome to also bring to those meetings as well. What curriculum, approaches, and interventions might we provide for these learners? So things like RTI, uh, in addition to the special education services, they might also be pulled in small groups for um, RTI purposes. Um, positive behavior support um, is a good technique and strategy to use with children with special needs. Least restrictive environment. We want to have them in the regular education classroom and participating and collaborating with their peers as much as we can. Um, most learners will still take the district screeners um, and state assessments. They will have accommodations provided on those, but um, they will um, still be required to take those if they can. In the regular education classroom and special education classroom, there's probably going to be a lot of modeling. Um, that needs to happen and different modes of delivery of instruction, providing visuals, written, maybe repeated directions, showing, um, you know, maybe having to listen to directions more than just one time. A lot of graphic organizers are ways to organize their thoughts, um, student feedback, and very explicit instruction. I wanted to take you and show you a short video clip. We're going to just watch a small section of this video, but it will give us an introduction to what explicit instruction actually looks like. Welcome to 
our video for high leverage practice number 16, Use Explicit Instruction. The primary sources for content in this video are Anita Archer and Charles Hughes's book, Explicit Instruction, and the High Leverage Practices and Special Education book published by CEC and the Cedar Center. There are 22 high leverage practices for special education spread across four domains. HLP number 16, Use Explicit Instruction, falls under the Instruction domain. This video is organized into two parts. First, we introduce and define explicit instruction. In part two, we break the practice down into four key components to illustrate how general and special education teachers are using explicit instruction to support the needs of students with disabilities across a range of settings. Part one, introduction to explicit instruction. Explicit instruction is one of the most extensively researched instructional approaches available to general and special education teachers working with students with disabilities. But what is it? Explicit instruction is really a set of teacher behaviors that are individually and collectively effective and efficient for supporting student outcomes. Put simply, explicit instruction helps teachers design and deliver effective instruction for a range of student learning needs. Teachers who use explicit instruction bring a laser-like focus on only selecting the most critical content students need to know, sequencing skills logically, and breaking complex skills and strategies into smaller instructional units. Teachers also highlight critical examples and non-examples. One hallmark of explicit instruction is teachers provide lots of opportunities for students to respond, to keep instruction moving at a brisk pace, and provide immediate feedback on student performance. Language used within explicit lessons is crystal clear. Another hallmark is explicit lessons are known for the I do, we do, you do instructional sequence. This means the teacher first models how to solve a problem or complete a task by thinking aloud and provides a demonstration. Then the teacher guides students through a scaffolded application of the skill or concept and provides feedback. Finally, students are provided opportunities for independent practice to ensure mastery. Students receive meaningful feedback at every step. And we're gonna pause that there to head back to our presentation. Um, we're, at our next meeting, we're going to get to dive more into explicit instruction and find out some other helpful techniques and strategies that we can do in the regular education setting to, to assist and help um, these learners. There are a couple common mistakes that educators um, sometimes make when working with students with special needs. Um, the first one is the thought that um, maybe they have a learner with special needs, but that teacher thinks that they know all of the accommodations that they need um, and but in reality oftentimes sometimes as teachers are not providing all of the accommodations that are required in their plan um, and so a way to avoid this is to make sure that you're in frequent contact with our special education um, educator um, on campus you reach out to them for help with manipulatives and hands-on materials you can have accessible to the learners in the classroom and that always make sure that you have um, the IEP or the plan handy that way you can reference it frequently and make sure that you are providing those accommodations to those learners. Another common mistake is sometimes teachers don't know how to identify a learner that may have a disability. And, um, and sometimes the parents are unaware as well. And so a good way to avoid that is from the start of every year, constantly monitor and track any type of assessments that are given to your learners. That way we can identify if learners are not making growth and if um, they are not being successful and we start trying some interventions and we're just not seeing adequate progress, then that would be a time where we would wanna bring that student up at our next data meeting um, and discuss next steps for those learners. How is the program monitored? 
So as administrators in the building and the special education teacher, we are frequently checking um, these IEPs and 504s to make sure that they are up to date and current. Uh, we will do a lot of data collection. We meet at data meetings, um, you know, monthly, and that way if any child starts popping um, that is not responding to intervention and small groups in the classroom, that's something that we can talk about frequently. Any meetings or updates and new information to the special education program, we would hold staff meetings in order to keep you updated on that new information. And then our district oversees any paperwork um, for each campus in regard to our special education learners that we have here. These are the sources and additional resources that I found and used in my presentation today. Thank you so much for being here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I will share the presentation with all of you. That way you have access to watching the rest of that awesome video to get more tips and tricks for helping our kids in the